Ignition sequence start. Five. declarations the words are on the screen if you're new with us say this with me I am who God says I am a child of God the righteousness of God I am the apple of God's eye I am God's workmanship created for good works and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me today I open up my mind to receive the Word of God so I can think like God be like God and do life the way God intended for me to live. Let's lift up holy hands, say it with me. Come Holy Spirit, help me elevate my thinking so I can elevate my life in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, y'all ready? Hey, one more time, give our McKinney, it's our second week, give them a big hand, Frisco. We love you guys. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And love on somebody as you're being seated. Tell them they're looking good today. It's such an honor to have you wherever you are coming from, and we've got people that drive as far away as two hours just to be here. I'm always amazed by that, and um, so thank you so much for whatever you did to weather the winter storms to get to church. You could have laid in bed. Some of you still are. It's okay, uh, but we're just glad all of you brave souls that just launched out into this weather to be here. So it's an honor to be with you, an honor to have you. And we are in our series launch. Uh, we believe it's prophetic. And, uh, you know, uh, I want to talk today about how to launch a great future, how to launch a great future. If you'd like notes, the ushers have them for you, and they'll have them for you there in McKinney as well. And uh, before I give you the big thought for the message, uh, when I felt like we were supposed to go this direction, launch, I had no idea that this last week, the most powerful rocket that's ever been launched would be launched. And uh, so anyway, I've got my NASA jacket on today. Josh came to me this week. He said, hey, Dad, let's get you a jacket. And uh, it's got all 12 Apollo missions on it. I am official. And uh, so anyway, and, uh, but this is what happened this week in case you missed it. Here we go. Ten, nine, eight, Side booster ignition. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Two. Ignition. That's the launch platform 39. All of our power missions were launched from there. That's what your life is going to look like in Jesus' name. Come on. Here's what we believe. What we believe is for everything in the natural, there's a supernatural correlation. And I just tell you this. made manifest by the things that are seen. And so whatever happens in the seen and the natural is always a picture in the supernatural what God's going to do. So get ready, get set. It's time for y'all to launch. Come on. God's going God's to launch some new great things in your life in 2018, and I'm excited about it. So how to launch a great future. The big thought for this message, the elevated thought is God is calling you to go. Say this with me. God's calling me to go where I've never been before, so you can see what you've never seen, be who you've never been, so that you can do what you've never done. How many of you believe God's got something better for you? Come on, he really, really does. And so today we're here to receive the word of God, and I wanna look at John, the fifth chapter in the Message Bible. And uh, the Bible says this, soon another feast came around and Jesus was back in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate in Jerusalem. There was a pool in Hebrew called Bethesda with five alcoves or five different levels of pools. Hundreds of sick people, blind, crippled, paralyzed 
were in these alcoves. One man had been an invalid there for 38 years. When Jesus saw him, he stretched out, and he saw him stretched out by the pool, and he knew, Jesus knew how long he'd been there. He asked him what seems like a rhetorical, obvious type question, and that is, would you like to get well? Do you want to get well? And you would think in verse 7, the man's simple response would be yes, but here's what he said. Well, sir, when the water is stirred, I don't have anybody to put me in the pool. And by the time I get there, somebody else is already in. Let me just stop right here and say this. Too often times, Jesus is trying to speak to us. He's trying to lead us. The Holy Spirit is trying to guide us. And the simple question is, do you want to get well? A good answer would be, but for some reason, this man with this 38-year infirmity, Feels like he's got to explain his problem to God. I just want to encourage you. When you're talking to God, don't feel like you got to explain what's going on. Like he knows exactly what's going on. And his simple question is, do you want to get well? Do you want things to get better? Do you want 2018 to be your best year ever? Do you believe that your future is better than your past? Do you believe that God's got good things for you because he's a good, good God? Amen? But this this man says, you know, I just don't have anybody to help me. And I don't know if you've ever felt like that. You know, I'd really like to do a business, but I don't have anybody to help me. I'd really like to get to the next level, but I don't really have anybody to help me. I I just don't feel like I have anybody to help me. And that was not the question, would you like somebody to help you? The question is, do you want to get well? Let me ask you a question. Do you want things to go well in your life? How about a better yes? You want things to go well in your life. Well, you know what, ha- you know what can happen is we can say, yeah, I do want things to go well in my life, but you got to listen, here's what's going on. And God knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly where you are. He knows exactly what you're facing. And so Jesus looked at him and he said, get up. Another word for that would be launch. Get up and take your bedroll and start walking. And the man was healed on the spot. In the name of Jesus, I'm prophesying and I declare in 2018 that you're going to be healed on the spot. Things are going to change on the spot. In other words, whatever spot you've been in, in the name of Jesus, you're going to get up. You're going to launch out of that. And in the name of Jesus, things are going to go well for you. Come on, put a big amen on that. That day happened to be the Sabbath, and the Jews stopped the healed man, and they said, hey, it's the the Sabbath. You can't carry your bedroll around. It's against the rules. (laughs) Oh, man. He's been crippled for 38 years. Jesus says, get up, take up your bed and walk. And the first opposition he faces is somebody says, you can't not be healed, but you can't carry that around. Let me just say, what used to hold you down is going to be the thing that you pick up and say, you know what, I'm I'm not, I'm not, that's not going to hold me back anymore. And so they said, who gave you permission? Who told you to take up your bedroll? He said, I'm not sure. The Bible says in verse 14, a little later, Jesus found him in the temple and he said, you look wonderful. Wouldn't you like to hear Jesus say to you, you look wonderful. You look wonderful. You're well. And then this is interesting. Don't return to a sinning life or something worse might happen. Let me, let me just say it a different way. To repent means to, in the Greek, the word repent in the New, in the New Testament is a Greek word called metanoia or metanoiu. And it literally means to change your mind. It means to reverse your thinking. So when I repent to God, guess what I'm saying? I want to think like you. I want to be like you. I want to do like you. That's what we start every service with here. Lord, help me to think like you. Help me to think like God, to be like God, to do like God. We're aligning our thinking, our being, and our doing up. Because watch this. Sinning, which is missing the mark. If you can picture a bullseye. Anybody here, by the way, playing darts ever hit the bullseye? Give those people a big hand. And even if you're lying about it, we're going to give you a hand. Give them a big hand. Anyway, 
How many of you wish you could hit the bullseye, but you've never quite done it? Let me tell you how to do it. Walk right up to that thing and stick that dart right in. I've hit the bullseye many times. But here's the truth. That's what sin is. God has this plan for us, and when we sin, we fall short of the glory of God. We fall short of what the best God has for us. And so God says, this is what you need to do. You need to repent. That means your level of thinking is what caused you to miss the mark. So change the way that you think, and you'll change the way you be. You'll change what you do, and you'll change what you have in your life. Everybody put your hand on your head. Come on like this. Just, just go with me here and say, God, help me to elevate my thinking so I can elevate my life in Jesus' name. So I want to talk to you about how to launch into a great future, and I want to give you some, just some very practical things. But Jesus, you know, he was confronted. The Bible goes on. He was confronted by these, by these sad UCs. He was confronted by these Jews. He was confronted by these religious leaders, and they questioned him about, why would you do this on the Sabbath? Why would you, why would you heal somebody after they've been sick for 38 years? I mean, don't you know? I mean, our rules are more important than what you think. You see, sometimes we don't realize it, but we make our rules. We make our paradigms. We make our ethnicity. We make the way our family's done it more important than what God says. And that's why even the man at 38 years of age, when Jesus said, do you want to get well? He flips back to his way of thinking. How many of you know when you've been crippled for 38 years and you've been believing, it'll take the yes right out of you. It'll take the I can right out of you. And you'll feel like you can't. And all of a sudden you're going through life and when the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords shows up and said, would you like to get well? You don't say yes because your yes is gone. You give your excuse. Well, here's why I can't, here's why this isn't going to happen for me. And some people excuse themselves out of the great things that God has for them. So even, even Jesus is confronted by these religious leaders and said, why did you do this? Why did you do this on the Sabbath? This is against our way of thinking, our way of being, our way of doing. You shouldn't have done that. And so here's what Jesus says in verse 24. It's urgent that you listen carefully to this. Anyone here who believes what I am saying right now aligns himself with the Father who has, in fact, put me in charge. Would y'all just be with me today and say, Jesus, you are in charge. Only you can give him charge of your life. He says, God's put me in charge and has at this very moment the real lasting life and is no longer condemned to be an outsider. This person has taken a giant step from the world of the dead into the world of the living. One small step for man, one giant step for mankind. It's time to launch, y'all. Come on. It's time to launch. God is about not just you taking your next step, but for you taking a giant step, for you launching into a great future. So if you're going to launch into a great future, a couple of things. Take a look at your notes. Number one, you've got to launch past your past. We all have a past. I wrote this a few years ago. Never allow negative words of the past to negate your positive future. The prophet Isaiah said this in Isaiah 43, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. How many of you have a little bit of a problem like me sometimes? You're dwelling too much on the past, come on. And he says this, see I am doing a new thing and now it will launch. It will spring up, the Bible says. But then there's this interesting question. Do you not perceive it? In other words, there's a new thing that God wants to do in 2018 in your life. But are you going to be somebody that steps back? Or are you going to be somebody that launches forth into what God wants for your life? I am making a way in the wilderness and I'm bringing streams in the wasteland. When you learn from what inspires you, you will build empires both inside and outside of you. You know what happens to us sometimes is we, we stop getting inspired. We stop knowing what it is that inspires us and it keeps us stuck in whatever has deflated us, in whatever has discouraged us. But when you learn what inspires you, what is it that inspires you then you will build an empire first on the inside. Before this cathedral was ever built, I saw it on the inside of me. 
It was like, whatever is manifest on the outside of your life, you've got you've to build that on the inside of you first, whatever it is in your life. You know, uh, I got a text. I, I text pastors, as many of you know, on Saturday nights and early Sunday mornings and just pray for them. And one of my friends um, in Nashville, uh, Danny Chambers, who's a great pastor and a great worship leader, said, hey, I just wanted to... I want to encourage you, man, take a look at, at Andre Crouch's old stuff. He said, it so inspires me. And I sent him a text right back, and I said, that's so funny. Just last week, I downloaded Andre Crouch at Carnegie Hall. Now, I'm going to tell you, some of y'all are too, you don't know about Andre Crouch. But how many of you here know about Andre Crouch? All right, these are the old folk right here. I bet they just raise their hand. In other words, you got to know, like my friend, Rod Bilhauer, what inspires you. You know what inspires him? The Bill Gaither trio. It inspires him. It doesn't matter if it doesn't inspire me. It inspires him. So guess what he should do? Get a regular dose of that. You see, what happens is we stop learning and appreciating what inspires us. And sometimes we allow what inspired us from the past to keep us from being inspired in the future. You know what inspire means? It means to breathe the breath of God. It means to breathe in the breath of God. So what is it that inspires you? That's what will help build empires on the inside of you so that what happens on the outside of you will be great. Somebody put an amen on that. What's, why is that so important? Because we've got to launch past our past. You know, it's Black History Month, and I'm so inspired by African Americans who have made great impacts. In fact, as a little boy, my uh, hero growing up, and I've said this many, many times from this pulpit and platform through the years, was Abraham Lincoln. And Abraham Lincoln was our 16th president, and of course, uh, actually was the president that gave his life so that there could be a true, not just emancipation proclamation, but so that slavery could come to an end. And that's one of the reasons he, was, he lost his life is because there was such anger and bitterness uh, because of that. And just growing up as an athlete, I didn't even know color. You know, it, was, it wasn't like, oh, that's a, those are black guys and we're white guys. I mean, we're, buddy, you know what I'm talking about. We're on the court and we're just playing together and not thinking one thing about it. And if it, people that were never involved in athletics or never in those environments sometimes don't know what it's like to be on teams with people of different color and how to benefit from that. And on and on and on I could go. But, but just in honor of Black History Month, I wanted to point out a few people today that have inspired my own personal life and that helped change the landscape of America. Is that all right with everybody? And first of all, George Washington Carver. You talk about somebody that had to launch past their past. Uh, just let me, let me just start by saying this. He was one of many children born into poverty. So what, what did he have to launch past? Poverty. And there's a lot of people that aren't born necessarily into poverty, but they've got a poverty mentality. You know what David prayed? He said, the Lord is my shepherd. I finished it, if you know it shall not want. What does that mean? In other words, I'm not going to make my, my, um, my sustenance, and sustenance and my resources have to be predicated on my job or my boss or what I'm paid or not paid. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It deals with our want from the inside out. And I could spend the whole time just talking about the difference between a poverty mentality and a prosperity mentality, but this is just one thing. He was born into poverty, but he wasn't just born into poverty, but he was born into prejudice. He was born into a very racially divided a, 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 a society filled with hatred just because of the color of somebody's skin. And so his mother was actually taken by a group of, of raiders called the Quintils Raiders, and they came into Diamond, Missouri, and they raided the house of Moses and, and Suzanne Carver. And they actually uh, took the people that were not slaves, but the people that were black that were actually working for them. They didn't believe in slavery. They were actually paying the people that were, that were with them. But these raiders came and they stole these people. They stole, did I say that right, Josh? Stole, 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 no D. My children helped me with my English because their mother majored in learning disabilities and elementary education. So while I preach, I just bounce words off of them 
But so it stole, right? So they stole. Anyway, they stole. <laughs> they stole. Um, that just totally does not sound right. I stole that. I stole that. I stole it. I'm not going to say I stole it. Hey, man, I stole it. That doesn't sound right to me. How many of y'all are with me? All right, thank you so much. So anyway, Jesus, help me. They stole all the people, and not only stole them, but they killed them. And George Washington, which was a baby, his mother was killed. His father was never seen again. Well, Moses Carver was so upset because Susan and Mary, Mary was the mother of George, they were best friends. And she was white, she was black. And he went after Quintil's Raiders all by himself. And two days later, he met up with him and he, he stood, one man, one white man stood against these other white haters and racists. And he said, I want the baby back. They told him the mother was already dead. I want the baby back. And they had George in a burlap bag. He was just about dead. And they said, we'll give this baby back if you give us your horse. Now, back then, the horse was the deal. The horse was the transportation. The horse was how you worked in the field. And so he traded his horse for this baby, George Washington. George Washington became George Washington Carver. He grew up with Moses and Suzanne, or Susan Carver. And here's these white parents that are raising this little African boy. By the time he was 12, he went to them and said, listen, I want to get a better education than I can get here. And he left home at 12. By the time he was in his teens, he was the first black African-American who enrolled in Iowa State University. And he excelled so quickly. He was so brilliant that he ended up uh, being a part of Tuskegee Institute. And he called his, his laboratory God's Little Workshop. There was a time in history, and some of you may remember this in history, where Alabama, their number one crop was cotton. They were one of the biggest providers for cotton for the United States of America. And the boll weevil came through and not only wiped out the cotton crop, but they, it, it wiped out the farmers. It wiped out, I mean, all of a sudden Alabama was in desperate uh, straits. And George Washington Carver introduced the peanut. And he said, listen, you can, you, the, the boll weevils won't eat peanuts. And here's what happened. He discovered nearly 300 uses for the peanut, milk, plastics, paints, dyes, cosmetics, medicinal oil, soap, ink, wood. From the sweet potato, he developed more than 175 products, molasses, postage stamp glue, flour, vinegar, starch, synthetic rubber, even a type of gasoline. From a pecan, he developed 75 different products. In 1927, he invented a process for producing paints and stains and rubber products from soybeans that are still used today. Henry Ford, the head of the Ford Motor Company, invited Carver to his Dearborn, Michigan plant during World War II, where the two devised a way to use goldenrod, to plant weed, to create synthetic rubber. Thomas Edison, the great inventor, was so enthusiastic about him, he asked Carter to move to Orange Grove, New Jersey, to work at his laboratories for an annual salary in the 1920s of $100,000. In today's money, that's $1.3 million a year. And he said, you know what? He said, I don't want to do that because I want to keep working in God's little workshop. That's what God's called me to do. In 1939, he was awarded the Theodore Roosevelt Medal for Distinguished Research in Agricultural Chemistry. Man of the Year in 1940 by the International Federation of Architects, Engineers, Chemists, and Technicians. Finally, he received his Doctorate of Science from Simpson College, the University of Rochester. In 1990, was inducted into the National Inventors Hall of Fame. You see, in 1923, five million bushels of peanuts were produced in this country. You say, what's the big deal about that? It became, within six years, a $200 million industry because of George Washington Carver, and it saved Alabama. In 1943, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt dedicated the first monument to an African-American in West Diamond, Missouri, the side of the plantation where Carter lived as a child because 
he actually, it was a, it was a, a, a monument that was dedicated in his honor because they went from being cotton croppers to peanut farmers and it saved the economy and saved America in a very difficult time during the, the depression in many, many ways. Dr. Carver tells a story, or told the story behind the discovery of his peanut byproducts. He says, one day I was talking to the great creator and I said, dear Mr. Creator, please tell me what the universe was made for. The great creator answered and said, you want to know too much for that little mind of yours. Ask for something more your size. Then he said, dear Mr. Creator, tell me what man was made for. Again, he said, the great creator replied, little man, you're still asking too much. So then he said, please, Mr. Creator, then can you at least tell me why the peanut was made? And he said, God began to speak to him about the peanut and over 300 uses for the peanut were invented and are still used today. Why? Because there was a man who launched past his past. He launched past in a very, in a very racially tense America, in a very, where a, a man, because of the color of his skin, was not even allowed in classrooms, was, was not even allowed to drink out of the same fountain as a white man. You have to understand, in the middle of all this, he achieved great things for the glory of God because it was for the glory of God and changed the landscape literally in the United States of America and created multi-million dollar industries. You see, if you're gonna have a great future, you have to launch past your past. All of us have a past. All of us have things that we have to work through, but it wasn't just natural poverty. It was demonic prejudice. It was demonic racism. So much of still today, the spirit of hate that we have in many places and in many hearts. You have to launch past your past. Here's what he said, a few quotes. 99% of failures come from people who have a habit of making excuses. He went on to say this, when you can do the uncommon things in life in an uncommon way, you will command the attention of the world. And then I love this. He says, do what you can with what you have and do it now. Do it now. Everybody say launch. You see, here was this great man. There's so much more I could say, but time won't allow me to. But who, who helped not only, again, shape the landscape of America, agriculture with inventions, with pecans and peanuts and soybeans and just simple little things because he took what God gave him and said, God, why is this important? And God used him to introduce a part of God to the world. If you're gonna launch into a great future, you have to launch past your past. The second thing is you have to launch past your faith or you have to launch your faith. Faith catapults us into what is foreign. Listen now, faith catapults us. It launches us into what is foreign so that what is uncertain can become certain and what is impossible can become possible. God spoke to Abraham, the father of our faith, and he said, I want you to leave your family of origin. I want you to leave your country, and I want you to go to a place that you don't know of. I want you to step out in faith. I want you to launch your faith. The Bible says in Romans, the 10th chapter, so then faith comes by, y'all help me, hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's why we need to get together, not just in church, but we need to gather, get together with other believers so that we can be built up, the Bible says, in the most holy faith. Neglect not the assembling of yourselves as some do, but when you come together, you're built up in holy faith. Hebrews 11, three and verse six says this, by faith we understand that the entire universe was formed at God's command, that what we now see did not come from anything that can be seen. Can I just tell you something? We serve a God that takes nothing and makes something. In your life right now, it may look like nothing is happening. Can I just give you some good news? God is always working in the unseen. He says, now what I need you to do is I'm already working on your behalf. If, if I'm a God that says, I'm going to create mansions for you in heaven, I'm already preparing those. I'm preparing a great future.
future for you. Your eyes haven't seen, your ears haven't heard. It hasn't even entered into your heart the great things that I have for those who believe in me. God says, listen, I know the thoughts that I have for you. They're good and not evil to give you a future and a hope. You see, sometimes we get so stuck in the minutia of now. We get so stuck in what's the priority of the present that God says, I wanna do something new in you, but you've gotta launch past your past. It doesn't matter if it's been 38 years. Get up! It doesn't matter what's been going on in your life. Get up! It doesn't matter what's been holding you back. Get up! It doesn't matter where you've been. Get up and take up your bedroll and walk because I've got something great in your future. Walk towards your future. Launch into your future. See, God wants us to understand that there's something we must do. It's impossible to please God, the Bible says, without faith. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that He is and that God exists and He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. You see, the difference between belief and faith, and I say this all the time and I'll continue saying it until we get it, until I get it. It's one thing to say, I believe. By the way, Josh preached a great message on Wednesday night. If you weren't here, I encourage you to get it. But one of the things he talked about is that 83% of Americans claim to be Christians. Oh yeah, I'm an American, I'm a Christian. Less than 34% of any Christian, person who claims to be a Christian goes to church on a weekend, on any given weekend. But more than that, it's one thing to say, I believe. It's another thing to take action on what I believe. How many of you believe you can have a great marriage? I hope if you're sitting next to that person, you've got your hand raised. Because let me just tell you something. As long as I'm in whatever I'm in, I believe it can be better. Otherwise, I'm projecting too much of the responsibility on somebody else, and I don't believe anymore because of them. You know why I believe, and you know why I take action based on my belief? Because it's my faith that God rewards. It's my faith that brings his super into my natural in a marriage, in a business, in a job, whatever the situation it is. So I can't project my discontent. I can't project my disillusionment. I can't project my impossibility, my thinking on somebody else. It all comes down to God says, without faith, Keith, it's impossible to please me. And I'm a rewarder of those that diligently seek me. What does that say? You're going to have to diligently seek me. The Bible says, Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. Somebody put an amen on that. Seek and you shall find. Knock and keep on knocking and the doors will be open unto you. That's my faith. To keep on keeping on, to keep on believing. But watch this now. If I want a great marriage, take action. Do what I need to do to make the marriage great. If I want a great job, to do what I need to do to make that job great. Not my boss appreciating me more. Not them paying me more. But by faith, me doing what I need to do so God can get involved and do whatever he needs to do to make it happen. Or whether it's running a business, it doesn't matter. In other words, it's my faith. Faith is a very personal thing, and that's why you've got to launch your faith. And when you launch your faith, your faith will catapult you into the foreign, into the uncertain. It'll make it certain. It'll catapult you into the impossible because with God, all things are possible. With man, things are impossible. But God, I trust you. I put my hope in you. I put my expectation in you. I live like it's going to happen. I give, y'all listen to me, I give like I'm going to be rich. I don't wait till I'm rich to give. Why? Because that's my faith. So every time I put God first, every time I give God over and above, here's what I'm saying. God, I put my faith in you. I give you the first dollar of every 10. Why? Because you said you'll open the windows of heaven. You said you'll rebuke the devourer on my behalf. So my faith says, I believe it. I'm going to take action and do it. And by the way, I'm going to give over and above because I know you want to bless me to be a blessing in the earth and to be God, to be Jesus, to be the Holy Spirit to other people through what you're doing in my life. So I can talk about believing all day long. But if my actions don't line up with what I believe, my marriage won't look that well, my business won't look that well, my life won't look that well. You've got to launch your faith. William J. Seymour 
Maybe you've heard of him, maybe you haven't, but after today, you're going to know who he is. He was born the son of freed slaves in Louisiana. He attended a Houston Bible school, but because of the Jim Crow laws, they let him come to school, but they wouldn't let him go to class. So as an African-American, he could go sit in the hall, but he couldn't be in the same classroom with white folk. That didn't stop him. He sat out in the hall. And he would listen. And he would hear about the Holy Spirit. And he would hear about the move of the Holy Spirit. And it stirred something on the inside of him that William J. Seymour wanted more. There was a little church in Louisiana that heard about his hunger for God. And they said, we'd like you to come. And we'd like you to be the pastor of our little church. And he came. And just a few people. But it was, it was one of the first that we know of interracial or where blacks and whites and people of color, they were all in, in one building. And his first message, man, he was talking about the power of the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit wanted to come down and sweep through the place. And everybody got so excited, except for a few people that weren't excited that happened to run the church. The next Sunday he went back and he was locked out of the church. And they said, well, we took a chance even with the color of your skin, but then this crazy stuff you're teaching. We just don't believe that. At 312 Bonnie Bray Drive in Los Angeles, there was a little house that a few of them started meeting in because the church doors were locked. And while William J. Seymour began to preach about the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit fell upon him and he had never spoken with tongues and he spoke in tongues and then all of a sudden another person and then another person and then the Holy Spirit began to fall and so many people over the next few weeks gathered at that one little place. In fact, you can go to Los Angeles and now it's a, it's a, it's a site for tourists. I don't know what you call that. What do you call that when somebody's, it's a landmark. It's a landmark. You can go visit 312 and, and you can see where it all happened. You say, what do you mean it all happened? You see, when the house, when the porch collapsed because so many people were there and were gathered on the street, they moved to a little horse stable place for $50 a month and on Azusa Street. It became known as the Azusa Street Revival. And from 1906 to 1909, the power of God fell. People came from around the world and the Holy Spirit spread to Europe and it spread to Africa and it spread to France and it spread all over the world because there was an African-American. There was a black man that said, it doesn't matter about Jim Crow laws. It doesn't matter if they lock me out of the, of the schoolhouse, even after they let me in. What matters is I'm hungry. I'm hungry for a move of God. I'm I'm hungry for the Spirit of God. And because of an African-American, Pentecost came again, not just in America, but around the world. I was a little kid, nine years old, just hungry for the things of God. Chris Schaefer and Sonny know what I'm talking about. I was in a little church called Bethel Temple in 210 East Jefferson in Oak Cliff. And they were kind of Pentecostal. There was one pulpit you spoke from and there was one pulpit that you sang from and it was just an interesting deal. Never quite figured that out. But as a little boy, nine-year-old boy, I'd go up to the front of the altar and just cry out to God. My mama would be on my left side, my mom would be on my right side. God, I'm just hungry for you. And I can remember the Holy Spirit would come on me as a little boy and the pastor would walk by and he's just kind of pat me on the head and said, well, what's going on with him? And I remember as a little boy, nobody taught me. I began to speak in tongues. I began to say, God, I just, I just want more of you. I want more of your spirit. And the Holy Spirit came upon me. And I remember the, the Sunday where I turned to my mom and I said, I think I'm called to ministry. I don't even know what that means. Maybe I'm supposed to go to Africa. And I'm just this little boy. And they're just going, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's wonderful. At 58, can I tell you that God has called us to establish a church that's going to touch the world, that the Holy Spirit is going to move in in a powerful way. I don't know what God wants to do. I just want God to do what God wants to do. That's what I want. Like William J. Seymour, who, who was the, the man, the one man responsible for the Holy Spirit coming again. He said in 1906, this is just the beginning. A hundred years from now and beyond, the Holy Spirit is going to come in a more powerful way than we've ever seen. I'm still believing. I'm still receiving. I'm still praying in the Spirit. You might, say, you might say, man, I'm a Baptist. I don't even know what you're talking about. Can I just tell you something? In case you don't know this, the largest churches in the world are not Baptist churches. They're not Nazarene churches. 
They're not any kind of denomination that you can put on the door. You know what they are? They're Pentecostal churches. You say, what does that mean? That means churches that are just open to the move of the Holy Spirit. The largest church in the world is in South Africa, over one million people. You see, the truth is God is still wanting to move. He's still looking for a remnant of people. He's still looking for people that say, God, I just want everything it is that you have. And God, whatever it is that you have, first of all, I want you to do it in me. Build the empire of the Holy Spirit in me so that through me, you can do in my life. And through us, you can do in this earth what it is that you want to do. So we built this cathedral in Frisco, Texas. We came here 18 years ago when there was just 28,000 people. And God said, you know what? I'm going to make this city great. I'm going to make this church great. I'm going to make this people great. There's going to be leaders, government leaders, great athletes, great entertainers, politicians, maybe even presidents that come from this place in the name of Jesus. Maybe I'm prophesying. Maybe God's launching something today in the spirit. Maybe we're we're a part of something that God wants to do like he's never done before. Come on, church. Come on. Through an African-American, this whole movement was launched. In fact, we have Elevate Life Church today because there's a man named William J. Seymour who said, I just want what the Holy Spirit wants. And I don't know why the lights went out, but here's what I know. All we need is one little light. This little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Come on, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Here's the last thing I want to tell you today. If we're going to launch into a great future, come on, how many of you believe God's got a great future for you? If we're going to launch into a great future, we have to be willing to launch past our past. We have to be willing to launch our faith. Not get sidetracked by, they wouldn't let me in the room because I'm black. They're trying to hold me back because of this or hold me. I, I just so honor these men who said it doesn't matter what the laws are. Nobody can keep God from building empires on the inside of me that would be manifest through me because the glory of God is in me. I just want to remind you, you've been crowned with glory and honor. I said, you've been crowned with glory and honor in the name of Jesus. Here's the last thing. Launch your greatness. And the lights are going crazy. It must be the Holy Spirit doing something. We'll, we'll say that, right? Technologically speaking. You know what I've discovered? There's just a lot of people that don't think they're that great. And the people that don't think they're, they're that great are always judging people that think they are great. You always tell somebody that doesn't think they're that great because they're judging somebody else that thinks they're great. Oh, they just think they're all that. Yeah, that's how God meant for you to live. You're a son and daughter of the Most High God. You're a light of the world. You're not a light in the world. You're a light of the world. Don't judge anybody's greatness because it makes you feel bad about what you're not. Launch your greatness because you've got greatness. And the enemy of your soul wants to try to beat you down, wants to think you're being held back, wants to, wants to think that... It's never going to happen for you. But I'm telling you, and I'm prophesying over myself. Keith Craft, you can prophesy over yourself too. Go ahead, lay hands on yourself. Your best days hadn't been lived yet. You might be 58, but you're not slowing down. God's stirring it up. Something good's coming. You're, I'm prophesying. Over, you better prophesy over yourself right now. Say things are going to get better and better and better. Come on, y'all. Woo. If you're sitting next to somebody that didn't do it, just stick your hand over them. Say, yeah, it's going to happen for you too. See, somebody don't even believe enough. Some people don't even believe enough in themselves to prophesy over themselves. You got to say what you hear so you can come on, see what you say. Say what you hear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, so you can see what you say. Launch your greatness. Martin Luther King said this. He said, everybody can be great because anybody can serve. You don't have to have a light to serve. No, I didn't say that. You don't, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love. Somebody put an amen on that. Martin Luther King went on to say this. He said, even if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted. I don't know what your job is, but get up and start giving it your best. 
launch, start making it your best. And whether you're a street sweeper, whether you're a truck driver, whether you're an insurance person, no matter what it is, guess what? This is your one life. Make it the best. Whether you're Beethoven, composed music, or Shakespeare, wrote poetry, he should sweep streets so well that all the host of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Launch your greatness. When I think about greatness, one of my favorites of all time, war number 42, Jackie Robinson. On this, this honor, this weekend, where I want to honor National Black History Month, I want to say that this is a man who also was born into poverty. What all three of these men have in common, they were all born in poverty. They were either slaves or sons of slaves. They experienced the prejudice, they experienced the poverty, they experienced racism, they experienced hatred just because of the color of their skin. His grandparents were slaves, his parents were sharecroppers. His father left their family soon after he was born, ran off with the neighbor's wife, he never saw him again. That's just enough to be mad about life right there and to be angry. His mother worked a series of odd jobs to support her children, moved the family to California and searched for a better life. Robinson attended John Murr High School, later Pasadena Junior College. It was there that he really began to excel in football, basketball, track, and baseball. What's amazing is he went on to go to UCLA and became the first student, first black student, but also the first student ever to letter in four different sports in a single season. In addition to baseball, he also shined in basketball as a guard, football as a quarterback, track as a long jumper. In fact, Robinson also moonlighted as a tennis player, as if he didn't have enough to do. He captured a few amateur titles during his summer breaks from school and his work. He later cashed his first checks as a pro athlete, not in baseball, but in football. After he finished his football career, he became a professional basketball player. After he became a professional basketball player, he served our country in the military for four years. And then in 1947, he was drafted by the Dodgers and he became the rookie of the year. He not only went to six National League playoff World Series games, but he was the most valuable player, most valuable rookie in 47, the most valuable player in baseball in 1949. You won't see any baseball players wearing the number 42. It was because in 1997, Robinson's number was retired, the one and only in history. For the first time, his number was retired on every team in national baseball. In fact, nobody can wear the number, but they were all honored to wear the number on April 15, 2004. It became Jackie Robinson Day, and all uniformed players in the Major League Baseball were required on that one day to wear number 42 on their jerseys to honor Robinson's memory and his legacy to the sport. What was amazing is he went on to star in his own movie. The Jackie Robinson story was one of the first black leading men. It did well in the box office. A lot of people didn't know that. He continued to break down racial barriers after leaving baseball. One of the first off field was after retiring from sports, he took a job at a coffee shop chain chock full of nuts and became the first black vice president of any major American corporation. In 1965, he made history again when he joined ABC TV Sports as the nation's first black baseball announcer. President Ronald Reagan posthumously awarded Jackie Robinson with the Presidential Medal Freedom Award, the highest award given to civilian for their contributions to world peace, culture, and other significant public and private endeavors on March 26, 1984. In 1999, he was named Time Magazine as one of the top 100 most influential people in the 20th century. Ladies and gentlemen, when I say that God wants you to launch into a great future, it doesn't matter the color of your skin. It doesn't matter the poverty. It doesn't matter the racism. It doesn't matter 
matter what they said. It doesn't matter what they did. You see, the truth is when we launch past our past, when we launch our faith, I honor these men today because they launched their greatness in some of the most difficult times. And our country's better. We're better for it. And you know what? Today, on this day, I want to declare to you that your best days haven't been lived yet, that the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you, the same spirit that was in William J. Seymour, the same spirit that was in Jackie Robinson, the same spirit that was in George Washington Carver, that same spirit. We are sons and daughters of the Most High God, and today is our day. This is our year, and we are launching forth in the name of Jesus. Come on, would you just clap unto God and shout with a voice of triumph? Yes! Yes! God, I thank you for your heart for us. I thank you for these great men. Lord, I honor them today as they honored you. I thank you, Lord, that even in our country right now, as we pause in this month and we recognize great African-Americans who've helped shape who we are as a nation. God, we acknowledge that much has been done, but much more needs to be done. And God, we thank you for the privilege that we have not as blacks or whites, but as kingdom people to advance kingdom culture in the earth. And God, we pray that Jesus, you would be lifted up and that you would draw all men unto yourself. God, we say the Lord rebuke you, spirit of hate, spirit of prejudice, spirit of racism, spirit of pride, spirit of anger, spirit of murder, spirit of hate. In the name of Jesus, God, we launch forth into a great future. God, I thank you that you have great things in store for us. You're a God that says, I have great plans for you. Call unto me, Jeremiah 33, 3, and I will answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things that you know not. I want to just lead you in a prayer. And if you're here, whether you're here in McKinney, just bow your heads all across this place. I want you to, some of you are here and you need to just get your heart right with God. I don't know what today means, what, what it all means, but here's what I know. God's wanting to launch us to places we've never been. And it happens on the inside of us. And if you're here and you say, Keith, I just need to get some things right between me and God. If that's you, whether you're in McKinney or you're right here in Frisco, if that's you on the count of three, I want you to slip up your hand. I want to pray for you right where you stand. One, two, three. Come on. Just slip it up. Say, I need to get some things right between me and God. I need to get it right today. Come on. Is there anybody else? Real quickly, you can put your hands down. Anybody else? All across this place. Just put your hands down. Everybody repeat this prayer after me. Say this with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of all my sins, all my mistakes, all my misses. I give you my life. I give you my past. I give you my present. I give you my future. God, I accept the challenge to launch into the great future that you have for me. I ask you to go before me, make every crooked path straight. Be my strength, be my source from this day forward in Jesus' name. Let's give God and the people who prayed that prayer a big, big hand today.